And all right, so let's get started. It is my pleasure to introduce you Paul Popola. Paul graduated from Lakehead with an Honours Bachelor of Commerce degree majoring in finance in 2010. He is a certified financial planner as well as a personal financial planner. Paul is currently an investment advisor with RBC and he will be doing the presentation today. So take it away, Paul. Perfect, thank you. Thank you for the, the kind introduction. Uh, I'm just gonna share my screen here. Uh, all right, perfect. How's that look? Can you see it? We're good? Perfect, perfect. All right, well, like I said, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a proud Lakehead alumni spent uh, some of the best years of my life in the city of Thunder Bay, originally from uh, Toronto slash London, Ontario. Um, never thought in a million years that I would end up in Thunder Bay. I didn't even know where Thunder Bay was or even heard of it. But uh, luckily I had opportunity um, to play sports and it took me to Lakehead, uh, played for the basketball team and had some great memories and developed some, you know, some friendships that I still have to this day. So I'm very, very grateful for that. So I'm sure a lot of people have similar Lakehead stories, whether it's at Thunder Bay or Aurelia, but we all are, you know, proud alumni and I'm happy to wear this, uh, this shirt today. So uh, I hope you guys are excited to talk about TFSAs, tax-free savings accounts. Uh, I know it was a very stimulating uh, topic and um, I'm excited to talk about it. So let's, let's get started. So first and foremost, uh, you know, I wanna thank you everybody for making the time today. Obviously we are in very interesting times. Um, I hope you and your families are doing well and taking care of yourself and staying safe. So I, I wish you that and I wish you the best. And uh, yeah, good kudos for yourself for making time today and, and investing in yourself. So um, this is today's agenda. Um, we got a lot to cover. So uh, you know we'll get right to it. Uh, hopefully yeah, we have some time at the end there for a Q and A. I'm very excited for that because that's like, you know, that's the that's the fun part where, you know, you get to see what people are thinking and what's on their minds. Um, but before I start, actually, I'm sure you guys, I don't know if you see my background, but you probably do see my background. So that picture of me is me when I was playing at Lakehead on the right behind me there. You guys can see that, that was me dunking. No, I'm just kidding. That's Michael Jordan. That's not me. <laughs> I wish that was me. Um, but on the left, on my, on my, I guess my left shoulder there, you see uh, a championship belt that's hanging there. Everybody sees that there? So I gotta tell you the story behind that before we start. So um, I'm not a wrestler. I box for fun, but I'm not a boxer either. But what I do do is I play basketball and I'm a very good shooter. So, you know, a shooter is, you know, like Steph Curry and, you know, those guys that, you know, Kyle Lowry. So essentially my friends and I, have been playing basketball our whole lives. And we have this competition where we do like a shooting competition. So we go around and see who could make the most threes. And uh, I've been winning for the past like 15 years. So this belt just lives at my house and I'm very proud to have it behind me. That's why it's showing there. So if you're just wondering if I'm a WWE champion, I'm not, I'm just a basketball player. Well, a, a former basketball player, a retired basketball player. Now I'm an investment advisor at RBC, like Jocelyn said, I've been with RBC for over 10 years. Uh, very happy to be with them, learned a lot, great career. And, um, you know, I'm here today to just share some of the stuff I've learned over the years at RBC. Um, you know, financial literacy to me is, is very, very, very important. Um, the reason why I ended up taking business and finance is because I didn't know anything about finances. Uh, grew up in a, you know, I guess lack of a better word, poor household, didn't have much. Money wasn't something you talked about, you kind of just, didn't ask about it or talk about it. And, you know, the school systems, I'm sure uh, for most, if you had the same experience I did, they didn't really teach us much either. And then we're, you know, fend, uh, uh, um, put out there to fend for ourselves and figure it out, right? And it's kind of unfair because, you know, money is something you can't avoid. Like, it's not like you can, you know, if I don't go to med school, I don't have to worry about cutting someone open. Like, it's, it's not, I'm never going to do that. Um, but if you don't know about money, like you can't avoid it. You, you are going to deal with money no matter what occupation, what profession you decided to, to do, you're going to have to figure out something to do with money. And hopefully, you know, you've done a decent job. And if you haven't, I know, uh, hopefully you can 
find someone like myself or even myself, you can reach out to me. I'm available. I'm an alumni like yourself. So I'm always here to, for conversations and someone who can, you know, ask questions and, and, and you know, bounce ideas off who understands uh, what's happening and is in the world. Because like I said, it is very, very important topic. And, and you know, money is one of the biggest stressors we have. So hopefully today we'll give you all you need to know about TFSA. So you never have to ask anybody about TFSAs. So you're good to go. All right. So if this is normal times, you see these two vehicles in front of me here. Um, I would have asked you how you got here today, but I already know where you are. You're in the comfort of your homes. Some of you are probably in your pajamas, I'm assuming, which is fine. As long as, you know, top up is good. That's all that matters. Um, so I would have asked you, yeah, how, how did you get here today? What transportation got, okay, so my thing's frozen. One second, let me try this. <laughs> I knew this was gonna happen. I'm gonna try sharing again. Come on, don't freak out. Yep, frozen again. This is, you know what? One thing you're definitely gonna count on with technology and Zoom life is something's gonna go wrong and you just gotta roll with it. So uh, let's try it one more time. I'm gonna share my desktop instead. So don't judge my desktop uh, and try it this way. There we go. Okay. Can you guys see? Give me a thumbs up, Jocelyn. Okay, perfect. All right, so I would have asked you, like I said, how you got here today, whether you took a minivan or you took a nice cool ride. Um, and the first topic I wanna to talk about is why, because you know, I think everybody should understand what we're talking about before we get into the nitty gritty of the TFSA. So what, am I, what I mean by why? So when it comes to the investment world, we, we call um, investments like TF, um, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, these are called vehicles, right? They're, that's the lingo we use. They're vehicles because this is the, the mode of transportation you're using to get to your destination. And your destination is whatever your goal is, whether it's retirement, saving for your kid's education, a brand new house, whatever your destination is, you're using a vehicle to get there. And as again, vehicles are stocks, bonds, ETFs, and these other investments that we, all, we always talk about. And then, we have what we call a, like the garage. So you park your vehicle in a garage, right? Most people, if you're lucky to have a garage, um, you park it in a, in a garage. And the thing about investment vehicles is you don't have to choose one or the other, right? You don't have to have just a minivan or a spider on the left there you see. You don't have to have one or the other. You can have stocks, you can have mutual funds, you can have ETFs, you can have all of them in one garage. The garage represents Products like RSPs, TFSAs, RIFs, lifts. These are the garages. This is where you house your vehicles, right? So it's just an analogy I like to use with clients. And I always start off my presentations by, by starting off with understanding the why and understanding what I mean by vehicles, which are the stock bonds, ETFs, mutual funds, and then understanding the garage, which is your RSPs, TFSAs, and whatnot, right? So you take your vehicles and put it in the garage. But one thing that everybody should have, and hopefully if you, if you don't, once again, speak to someone like myself, is you should have a roadmap, right? People come to me all the time sometimes. Well, not sometimes, I say, not all the time. Sometimes they come to me and they're not, they're, they're, the first thing they say to me is, Paul, I have a bunch of money. Make it make more money. I want to make the most I can make. Give me a bunch of money back. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, you, you, first and foremost, what is the goal? What is the purpose of your money? Like, what do you want it to do for you? It's a vehicle. Once again, that's why I always say it's a vehicle. I would not take a helicopter to go across the street. That is not a smart way to use a helicopter, right? But I also wouldn't bike to go across to, Lo to London, Ontario, for example. I don't, I, someone might, but I wouldn't bike to London, Ontario. That's, that's nuts to me. I would take a car. So, the vehicle that matters, right? You have to make sure you have the right vehicle to get to the destination. So if you don't know where you're going, if you don't know your destination, how are you gonna select the vehicle? So when people come to me and say, I have X amount of dollars, uh, put in something that's gonna grow. I wanna make a, a high return. It just, to me, that doesn't make sense. I just tell them, I, I'm honest and blunt and tell them, I can't help you, my friend. Give me more information. Let's figure out what you want this money to do for you. Is it for a house? Is it for your retirement? Is it for your kids' education? Once we understand the destination, then we can put you in the right vehicle to get your destination. All right, 
I'm done with that. Let's move on. So TFSA, what is a TFSA? Okay, so tax-free savings account. In my personal opinion, I feel like the government misnamed this. I don't know if misname is a word, but I'm using it. Uh, it's not the right name, right? In my opinion, it should be called tax-free investment account. Right. The reason why I say that is because a lot of misconceptions of what a TFSA does, what it is, and what it can do for you. Right. So a TFSA, tax-free savings account, is a registered account that can be used for short-term, long-term investment goals and allows you for tax-free withdrawals, okay, and tax-free growth. It was started in 2009. So I'm going to put a little disclaimer here. The slides were made uh, last year. So as of January 1st, 2021, you're allowed another $6,000 into your TFSA. So you get, it's going to come into play later because I'm going to have numbers. And I just want you to understand that your limit for your TFSA right now is 75500 and not 69500 which was last year. So every year you're allowed to increase the amount that you have. So the government allows you to have uh, $6,000 as of right now contribution every year. Okay, so just keep that as a caveat, when you see the numbers, we're pretending we're still in 2020. I know you guys love 2020 so much that I'm going to go back to 2020, okay? So that's what we're going to do. All right, so the, one of the primary and the biggest questions I get when it comes to, uh, you know, just finances in general is which is the best account to use? Should I use a TFSA? Should I use an RRSP? Should I use a non-registered account? And obviously, you're probably going to guess it. My question is, it depends, right? Like, once again, understand the destination that we choose the vehicles and we choose the garage to park the vehicle. So it all depends. So I have a little chart here to kind of explain the difference between the most popular registered accounts, right? So the tax-free savings account, like I said, very simple. Started in 2009. The whole point and the, the, the biggest I guess the uh, advantage of the plan is that you could put money into this account, allow it to grow tax-free so we don't get taxed as it grows. There's no tax being uh, charged to you. You can recontribute you know, any withdrawals that you've made, right? So if you take out money, you can put it back in. Doesn't impact any government benefits you have, right? So some, you know, some people who may be an ODSP or something like that, they're income tested. What that means is, any income you have will reduce your government pension. So old age security, something like that as well. So, you know, I'm sure there's a bunch of young people on the line, I don't know who's here, but if you are receiving old age security, that is income tested. Meaning that if you make a certain, over a certain amount, the government will start clawing back your mo the money. They'll start taking it back from you. So if you have a TFSA, however, you, have, you don't have that problem, right? Because the money that's come out of the TFSA does not impact any government benefits. Um, there is no maximum age of contributions. You can contribute to your 110 years old and plus if you get to live that long, right? There's no age limit of contributions. So once again, benefit is you put money in here. It grows tax-free. Nobody touches it. Nobody can touch it. No government entity can touch it. You can withdraw anytime you want, pay no taxes, and you can recontribute into, the, into it again. It doesn't impact your government benefits. Then we have RRSPs. Right, so probably the most infamous of the accounts, you know, people, some people love it, lots of people hate it. I don't know why, because it's just an account. I mean, <laughs> I don't know why you love or hate it. It's, to, it's just there to help you. <laughs> and you gotta understand what, it, once again, I think a lot of it is misinformation and not understanding what it is, right? Because people fear what they don't hate, what they don't, I mean, people fear what they don't understand, right? And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rap quote by my, one of my favorite rappers, Nas. Humans hate what they don't understand, right? So you gotta like understand it. And then once you understand it, you know what the pros and cons are to, to using it, right? So an RSP, you put money into this plan. The benefit is that you get an immediate reward. What I mean by that is when you contribute to the plan, the government will allow you to reduce the income you're paying in that year. So simply said, if you make $100,000 in a year, let's say, and you contribute $10,000 to an RSP, what happens then is you get to take that 
and deduct it from your income. So the government will give you back a refund, essentially taxing you only on $90,000 that year. So you made 100, you took 10,000, put it into an RSP, the government gives you back a refund, which in essence means they only tax you on 90,000. So that's an immediate benefit for the RSP right away. So if you're making a higher income, if you're someone in a higher you know, tax bracket and you're paying a bunch of taxes, it really doesn't make sense because you can actually reduce how much taxes you pay by contributing to an RSP. Another thing with the RSP is you have to accumulate room. Where the TFSA, you just, everybody, as long as you're over 18 years old, you just, you're allowed to put money in there. You're, you get the room available to you every year. If you don't work, you don't make income, right? Taxable employment income, the government doesn't give you any room to contribute to an RSP. So once again, obviously if you're not working, then you're not getting tax, so it doesn't really matter. But if you're working in a high income bracket, you should definitely consider an RSP. However, there are some caveats, all right? So once again, people hate it and love it. People hate this part of it because when you take it out, you're gonna get taxed at the full marginal tax rate. What that means is you can tax at the highest rate that you can get taxed, right? So, um, so that's not that's why people don't like it because they, they say, you know, oh, I'm putting this money in here and eventually I'm gonna get taxed on it. Yes, you will. But what I don't understand is if you don't put it in there, you're gonna get taxed anyways. So it's like, my, my analogy is like if, if you owe someone money and they say, okay, you can pay me right now all everything you owe me or hold that money for 20, 30 years and pay me later. I'll keep the money and pay them 30 years later, right? I just don't understand why you give your money away right now when well, you can actually keep your money, use it for whatever benefits, invest it, let it grow even more, and then pay later. And a, even a bigger benefit is the fact that in the future, generally when you're not working, your income actually is lower. So when your income is lower because you're not receiving employment income, you actually get a savings there because now you're making 100,000 now, you're in a high bracket. You put money into an RSP, you save your taxes. The government doesn't tax you now. Later on, when you're making say 50,000, you have a lower tax bracket now. And then you've saved this money all along for the past 30 years. That money that government would have took otherwise, you're investing it, you're growing it, it's making more money for you. And then later on, you pay at a lower rate because your income's lower. So to me, it really, I really still, for the past 10, uh, 10, 11 years, I don't understand why people hate it so much. It's, it's, it's either you, it's gonna help you or you don't use it, right? If you're gonna make less money in retirement and more now, consider an RSP. All right, let's move on. Non-registered account, um, that's just an account that people use when they are out of RSP or TFSA room. So essentially, um, there's really no tax benefit. So you don't get a tax, um, deduction like an RSP. In addition, whenever you take money out, you will be paying taxes. So capital gains, dividends, interest tax. So it's not really huge tax savings. Usually you do it because you have no other, you know, other choice, right? So you kind of, you still want to invest. And so you invest in a non-registered account. All right, so which one do you choose? Like I said, it really depends. It really depends on your situation. And I broke it down the most popular ways uh, people invest money, okay? so. How contributed, uh, contributions accumulate? Uh, this is all jumbled up here, but essentially, um, I hope you guys can see that, but it started in 2009, like I said. Um, first, it started at $5,000 that the government allowed for contributions. Then that was bumped up to 5,500 per year. Then I remember the conservatives were in, were in office. And for one year, we were allowed to do uh, 10,000, which was amazing um, if you had the money to do so. But then the liberals came back in power and said, nope, nope, nope. Let's bring that back down to reality, to back to 55. And then in 2019, they bumped it to 6,000. So generally they, they will increase it, you know, periodically based on inflation, you know, CPI, cost of living. So they will bump it up. So it just it was all, it's been all over the place because that one year was an anomaly where we did, it was a 10 year, uh, $10,000 you're allowed to put in that one year. So remember I said earlier, the numbers are not correct up to date, but as of 2020, 
you were allowed to do 69,500. And like I said earlier, as of January 1st, 2021, you're allowed another $6,000 to put into your TFSA, okay? So yeah, so as you can see there, that's the you know accumulation uh, kind of chart there on the right. So another big issue with TFSAs, and this happens way more than I would like it to happen, is when people start withdrawing money and re-contributing, right? It, you really gotta be diligent and keeping track because you are allowed to re-contribute. However, if you over-contribute, there's a big penalty. Personally, I've been there, I've over-contributed. It wasn't my fault, I don't, I blame the government, but that's just me. Um, <laughs> but uh, it happened. Um, I wasn't, fortunately I wasn't taxed because usually, you know, your first offense, they will, they will let you slide if you, you know, have a good reason. But you gotta be very careful because the, the over contribution is, they tax you 1% per month, okay, on the, on the over contribution. So from an example that we have here is say you have 63,500 in TFSA in 2019, you would draw 6,000 because you want to travel you know, to Europe, let's say, and have a great time. Um, after you would draw, you now have 57,000 remaining in your TFSA. Um, now, let's say starting January 1st, 2020, you want to put another $6,000 you, you can, right? Because now you have a new year to put $6,000 in because every January 1st, they allow you to do additional contributions. But even better is you can recontribute the amount you withdrew in the past, right? So that's the good thing about the TFSA is you can recontribute, but you gotta be very careful. So let's say for example, in 2020, you hit the maximum of um, 69,500, okay? And you, you took out, let's say in 2020, so you say March, 2020. You took out, I don't know, let's say a thousand dollars. That thousand dollars, you cannot recontribute that thousand dollars until 2021, right? So even though you have less than 69,500 because you took out money, the government doesn't care. In that year, you hit your maximum, right? So you can take all of it out, right? It doesn't even matter. That year, you've hit your maximum, so you can't recontribute back. That amount in the same year. You have to wait to the following year. So very simple example, 2020, you had 69,500. You took all of it out because you wanted to travel the world. And then you came back in that same year and you got a bunch of money. You can't put that money back in. You would have to wait to January 1st, 2021. And then you could put back 6,000 for that year, plus the previous 69,500 you withdrew from the previous year. Okay. All right making the most of your TFSA. All right, so the thing that I love about the TFSA is the flexibility. It's, um, you know, it's an all purpose account. You can use it for anything, really. It can be used for emergency funds, contingency funds, TFSA, you can let it compound grow. Uh, it can be part of your investment plan. It can be part of your retirement plan. It can be part of your estate plan. So it's very, very flexible. And that's why a lot of people like it. That's why I like it is that with the RSP, for example, if you put money into an RSP, you have you got to kind of plan it. You got to kind of think about it because, as I said earlier, when you withdraw, there's tax implications with that. With the TFSA, there isn't, right? So it allows you for more, allows you to have more flexibility to use it as you see fit, whether it's for long-term retirement, estate planning, or short-term, you know, house purchase, emergency fund type of situation. Okay, so. It gives you that flexibility in that account. All right, let's talk about the compound growth of the TFSA. This is like the best part of the TFSA is the fact that you don't have any drag, any tax drag, right? So the simple example here shows someone who wants to contribute, uh, say 5,000 annually in a, let's say a balanced mutual fund that's making let's say a 6% return. Um, so if someone had a choice Say it's two brothers, one brother, you know, twin brothers, I say, I don't know. Put it, he put one person put it into a, a TFSA, the other person put it into uh, a non-registered account. So outside of a TFSA. Remember, I said earlier, the non-registered account has taxes, right? So you pay tax on dividends, 
capital gains, interest, you pay tax on that, right? So let's say that person is in its 32% tax bracket outside of the TFSA. So if you look at the chart there, I mean, I don't have to go through it. You guys all could, can see, you all have eyes, I'm sure. You can all see um, that is very simply split. You know, as the time goes on, the TFSA compounds even more, right? It, it, it compounds over the years. And the longer you keep it in there, the larger the compounding becomes and the more you save, okay? So that's the benefit and the power of a TFSA is allowing time, right? Father time to work for you and to use it to your advantage and as, as the compound goes over the years. Oh man, it froze again. One second, sorry. <laughs> All right, there we go. Okay, so TFSA, like I said, it can be used for many things. Um, you know, a lot of people do use it as a, T, uh, as a contingency emergency plan. I have, I have a, um, a bias against this, I'm just being honest. Um, I am very, very much against people using the TFSA as like a savings account. And I'll tell you why, I'll tell you my grievances in a second here, okay? So TFSA is a wonderful account. In my opinion, the best account we have in Canada. And it just hurts me to see people have it sitting in cash, like just savings cash. And it's just like, I, once again, another thing where I have to say something when I see it, and maybe once again, it's misinformation. There's no problem. Yeah, you can use it as an emergency fund, but why does it have to sit in cash, right? Because the power of the TFSA, which I showed you earlier, is the compounding effect. And the fact that you could invest in here and let it grow and pay no taxes. Let me repeat myself, no taxes, right? So if you have a TFSA and you're sitting in cash making, God knows what banks are paying these days, I don't know what, 0.2% um, on a, like a cash account. Like it, to me, it just, it boggles my mind. Like why even use a TFSA? Just put it in your regular account. Like it's not benefiting, right? So it would make more sense to invest in your TFSA. That's why I said the name is a wrong name for it. The government gave it the wrong name and the people are using it in the wrong way sometimes because it has tax-free savings where it should be tax-free investment account. Because I have some clients who literally have 200,000, 300,000 in their TFSA right now, right? Um, because, and they only put the, you know, 75,500 because they've allowed compound growth. So some of them have got lucky, you know, say you hold, Say you hold a Tesla stock in a TFSA and you've made 1500% insane. Um, you get to keep all of that money, right? And the people during the, like the marijuana craze that we had, um, you know, people had the money in the TFSA. And I've seen some people with $500,000 TFSAs. Insanity, right? And they get to keep every single penny of that money, right? So to me, once again, it just doesn't make sense to have just cash sitting in a TFSA. If you want an emergency fund, great. Have a savings account. Use a TFSA as your investment account. Invest there, let it grow, and pay the government nothing and keep all of it to yourself, right? So that is one of my grievances I have, and you guys have heard it from me and I've shared it. I feel much better, thanks for the therapy. So. That's how I feel about that, okay? So just remember that, keep that in mind. Um, okay, there's more, more um, to what I was saying. So with the TFSA, you know, you can have like the, the, the cash style investing, which is like I said, you know, people have GICs, guaranteed investment certificates, um, you know, or just cash. And these, you know, like I said, it's very limited options. Um, I would probably not do that, I would do, something along the lines of investing the money in either stocks, bonds, or mutual funds, okay? And allow, allow it to grow. Another benefit, huge, huge benefit of a TFSA is income splitting, okay? So I'm not sure how many people are married on this call with spouses, girlfriends, whatever uh, it may be, uh, boyfriends, whatever. Um, 
But this is a great way to allow your spouse to also save and for you to save as well, okay? So remember, if you invest in a non rich so let's say, you know, I'm married and I have a good income and I'm investing my money and I invest, I max on my TFSA, I max on my RSP. Now I'm left with a non-registered account. Remember I said earlier, the non-registered account has no benefit. I'm paying taxes on capital gains, dividends, interest. Why would I do that if my spouse, my wife, you know, has TFSA rooms, right? So she has available TFSA rooms. She doesn't max out her TFSA. I can give her 69, well, 75,500, excuse me, and have her invest that money in her name. And then now she can get the tax-free savings, the tax, invest, you know, invest it, let it grow. And now combined, you know, as of 2020, we have, you know, 30, 139,000 of tax-free savings available to us. So this is a great way to allow households to income split and to grow their wealth even faster, rather than you hoarding your money and just paying taxes, share the wealth, let your spouse have a TFSA in their name and let them have that tax-free growth available to them as well, okay? And this can be passed on to your children even so, right? I have clients, you know, who've done well for themselves and they are able to share the wealth with their kids. So now, you know, an example there you see, you know, that's up to 200, almost $300,000 for a family of four to be able to invest and not pay a penny to the government, right? And I know we, you know, they say there's two things that are certain, death and taxes, right? But this is a way to avoid the last one, the latter, the taxes, right? This is a great way for you to, you know, if you have kids that are, you know, over the age of 18, it's a great way for you to, you know, help them and even help yourself and be able to split income and have everybody invest and pay nothing to the government and keep the money to yourself. I actually had an example this morning. Um, it was a, a client called me uh, and she was just, just talking. And I remember when I met her, she had like, you know, at RBC, we have like a share purchase program. You can, you know, purchase uh, shares, RBC stocks through non-registered account, TFSAs, RSP, whatever. And she had it, her stock purchase option going into a, a non-registered account. And I, you know, I noticed these things right away. I'm like, why don't you have a TFSA? And I get, I know why she did it because she's been at RBC for the 30 something years. And when they first started, they didn't have the TFSA as an option. So she just probably chose a non-registered option and nobody has spoken to her about converting that to a TFSA. So I, I spoke this morning, we spoke and she's like, she was just like very grateful because we changed it to a TFSA years ago and she needed some money. Um, and she said, you know, she has capital gains, just big capital gains. She's like, if I touch my non-registered account, I don't have to pay tax on it. If I touch my RSP, I have to pay taxes on it. But I remember we did a TFSA thing. Can I take that? And I had to re, you know, explain to her, yeah, this is the point of it. You can use your TFSA right now because she's like receiving, you know, she's working, she's just getting CPP. So she gets takes out of the non-registered or the um, RSP that has more, more income that she can tax even more. So now it allows her to actually take out of the TFSA and not worry about a single penny of taxes being levied on her. So she was very, very grateful and was able to take the money out of the TFSA to do, you know, whatever she needed to do because something happened and not worry about taxes or affecting, you know, her income in any way. So that's the power of a TFSA. And I think it's a great account. And that's why we're having this presentation today. Okay. Um, so TFSAs can also be used as part of estate planning. So a beautiful thing about registered plans is the fact that you can add a beneficiary. Right, so a beneficiary just means that you designated someone that if God forbid, you know, you were to pass away, um, you, that person will get that money. It will bypass your will. There'll be no probate levied on it. Um, so it actually will save money, your, your estate will save money and the money will go directly to your beneficiary, the person you des designate as that. So a TFSA can be done as that in that way as well. So you can actually, put a, a beneficiary for the TFSA. The great thing about it is actually, you know, with the RSP, for example, let's say you designate a, a, a beneficiary and that person is not your spouse. If it's your spouse, it rolls over 
tax-free, but if it's not your spouse, say it's your child or someone, what happens is it'll go right to them, but your estate will be liable for the taxes, right? So if it's 100,000 in your RSP and that 100,000 would pass on to your child, they'll get 100,000. But now that there's income that your estate has generated, $100,000 income, and that has to be paid somewhere, right? With a TFSA, there is no such thing. Um, the money be passed on to your beneficiaries tax-free and there is no tax to your estate. In addition to that, um, you can actually put a, a, you know, something called a successor annuitance for spouses where the TFSA can be rolled over to your spouse, which is amazing because what happens is it rolls, up, rolls over to your spouse in the TFSA and they don't, it doesn't affect their TFSA rule. So I know spouses, you know, they've passed away and then their spouse's TFSA gets added to their TFSA and it doesn't affect their room. So they have like, you know, 100,000 plus, but they still get to add, you know, add their money. It doesn't affect their particular room. They just get to absorb their spouse's TFSA and then the proper terms roll over to the spouse and they get to have that. So it's a great uh, plan for estate planning. If you're concerned about, you know, taxes being levied at, you know, when you pass away or anything like that, this is a great way to be able to pass money uh, on to the next generation without having your estate pay taxes or even um, you know, your, your beneficiaries paying any, any type of taxes as well. So uh, yeah, that's the benefits of a TFSA. So I just wanna leave some room for some questions. And so that is the end of my presentation. Um, some disclaimer there from RBC, uh, just to cover ourselves, um, but yeah. I'm pretty much done here. Um, I'm looking forward to some questions. If you have any questions, and uh, yeah, let's get it started. Jocelyn, I guess I'll pass it to you or Sam. Yeah, yeah, I definitely. I have some questions that uh, some people wrote in. Um, I just want to say that was a great presentation. <laughs> Thank you for all that information, and I think you brought forward so many great tips about investment options, income splitting, estate planning. Uh, to name a few. Um, so I thought that was great. And I also like the TFIA, tax-free investment <laughs> account. I thought that was, I'm going to remember that one, probably repeat it to people, but let's get to questions first, because I'm sure we may uh, even learn some more through these. Um, so the first one I have um, is, okay, so someone wrote in, I trade North American stocks within my TFSA, do I need to track and declare profit loss when I sell shares as part of my annual income tax filing? That's a great question. Um, so yeah, if it depends, right? So if you're like the government is clamping down on day traders, right? So with a TFSA, and I'm not an expert in this, but I'm an investment advisor, financial planner. We don't we don't day we don't we don't have day traders, so it doesn't really apply to us. But if you're someone who considers themselves a day trader, a day trader, like people, some people, I have friends who think they're day traders, but it, they're not day traders. So they're not. They, they, they sell something once a week or maybe once a month and they think they're day traders. Um, but if you're a day trader and you're actively trading on a, you know, um, a lots and lots of trades and every single day and you're buying and selling and you're looking for those quick, um, you know, profits, then you gotta be careful and I would say reach out to your accountants or even a CRA specifically because they may, you know, come after you because they may consider that as a, you know, a job, like you're working, like this is a job for you. So we want to make some money off of you. And that's what we do in Canada. That's what happens in Canada. If you make money, the government wants a piece of it, right? If you're working. But, um, you know, investing and day trading is, is, is to me is different because like I said, day trading is a job, like it's, it's someone's profession. So the government will want to be taxed. But if you're just, uh, you know, a, a casual trader, like, you know, someone like myself and I, I, I buy and hold, I might, I don't really trade much, but I, time to time I do sell, I rebalance, I do things like that. If you're someone like that, you don't have to worry about any, reporting anything. The, the whole point of the account is that you don't pay any taxes, you don't report anything, and you keep everything. Um, so for those that only trade kind of occasionally, do you think they need to keep track of those trading transactions in the event um, Revenue Canada changes their rules? I mean, I know from a kind of tax standpoint, you should be holding on to your things for at least um, seven years. 
right. but um, yeah, should they should they worry about that? Um, I mean, I'm gonna be just talk specifically myself. Once again, I am not a tax expert. So if you're talking about tax specific, speak to your accountant and have a conversation with that person or call CRA. All I know is the rules are the rules now and you can, okay, like you're allowed to sell and buy. And I don't necessarily keep track of every single transaction because there's so few and far between that it, it doesn't really matter. But if, yeah, if you're concerned, first and foremost, speak to a tax specialist and yeah, it doesn't hurt to keep track. If you want to keep track, if you some, I have some, I know people who are very, you know, like paranoid and anxious and things like that. And, you know, it helps them sleep better at night to have those records. Then why not keep those records? But in, as far as I know, um, the rules as of right now, I don't see them re retroactively going back to, you know, to get someone because that's a, a kind of a nightmare politically. Uh, but I can't speak specifically to that. I say talk to an accountant, but for someone who's occasionally trading, I think you're fine. But that's just my opinion. But speak to an accountant. Yeah. I usually on a, they'll do it on, if they make a change, it'll be on a go forward basis. But, right. Um, okay. Another question. So you had mentioned that when you walk, withdraw from your RSP, you will be taxed at the highest income bracket. Um, do you mind explaining that? Yeah. I mean, okay. The, the highest income bracket for you, right? So um, I'm sure that's, that, thanks for clarifying that. Um, so I'm sure most people notice that, you know, uh, the more you make, the saying goes, the, the more they take, right? So that's how it works in Canada. We have a progressive tax system. As your income grows, um, your tax bracket or your tax where you are, land, uh, where you land is actually higher. So what I mean by marginal, so let me explain. There's something called average taxes and there's marginal taxes. Average taxes, let's say Jocelyn makes $100,000 a year. Jocelyn, and I, let's say I make $50,000 a year. On Jocelyn's first $50,000, she'll be taxed the same as me, right? Because uh, I made $50,000, let's say. Um, so that's, that's what would happen, right? But on her $51, she'll be taxed at what we call the marginal rate. That is the next dollar, like the next, it's called other income, right? The next dollar up. So I don't have the chart here. I didn't think we we're going to get into that, but there is a chart if you want, you can look at it at CRA and look at the tax brackets. And as your income grows higher, you get taxed at different levels. So the average tax that, you, you know, like I said, it's two different things, the average tax and, 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 and marginal tax. So if I make $50,000, like I said, I'm gonna have an average tax. That means like what I pay from zero till 50, right? The first like $11,000 is not taxed anyways, but let's just say I'm from zero to 50, I have an average. An average is just, you know, you know, we all know averages, you know, right? So that's the average I've paid because along the way, there's different brackets, right? So my average would be that number. The marginal just means the next dollar. So my 51st dollar will be taxed, not on my average, but then the highest marginal rate that I have. So that's why when you would draw from an RSP, a lot of people hate RSPs, like I said, because they, my, my own mother, you know, it just, it still hurts me to this day. My own mother, and I don't know how this happened without me knowing, but she ended up drawing a whole chunk of money out of her RSPs. And then years later, started complaining to me about, oh, the government, this, I hate RSPs. I'm like, what are you talking about? What happened? And then she explains to me, I'm like, do you know what I do for a living, mom? Why don't you just ask me first before you did that? Like, I, I don't know, but that's my mom. Um, so... She hates RSPs now because she made a mistake and someone advised her incorrectly and now she hates it. And I don't blame the RSP for that. I blame my mom for that. That's, that's a mistake she made, right? So you gotta understand the, you know, the, the tax implications that will happen. So once again, I say you get taxed at your highest marginal rate. That means the next tax bracket is what they tax you at when you withdraw from the RSP. And that's why it's so high. That's why you gotta be careful when we're drawn. So a good time to withdraw from RSPs are like, I have clients who go on mat leave, right? They've, you know, accumulated, made, you know, a lot of clients, I have a lot of clients who've done well and, you know, making $300,000, $400,000 a year and they go on mat leave and then it drops to $50,000 a year. Now they have an opportunity to start taking out of their RSPs 
and pay at a lot, much lower rate than when they go back to work. When they go back to work, they're back at their high income again. And now, um, you know, they don't want to necessarily take it out of there. So mat leave, retirement, sabbaticals, traveling the world, take a year off. These are times when you can use the RSP. Um, one more thing I forgot to mention, and I didn't really want to go into it because it's, it's not about RSPs today, it's about TFSAs, but there's something else called uh, you know, the first time home buyers plan. I'm sure many people have heard of this, where you can actually uh, take money out of your RSPs, uh, 35,000, they increased it last year to 35,000, it used to be 25,000. So 35,000 you can take out of your RSPs, pay no taxes and use it towards your first home, okay? The caveat is you have to pay it back, right? The government gives you uh, 15 years to pay that back. If you don't pay it back, what they do is they just tax you on it. So yeah, just pay it back, right? So hope that answers your question. I know I went off on a tangent, but that's <laughs> more information, so it's better. Yeah, I think it does. Just basically it's the, the yeah, the marginal, uh, highest marginal tax rate for you um, when you withdraw or um, that's the benefit when you, uh, when you, you said it much better than I did, more consistent. No. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to move along to these questions. So one of the listeners actually mentioned, and I, I, I think this would be handy too. So um, they were looking for a computer template to keep track of TFSA deposits and withdrawals. Are you aware of one or do you maybe have a template that, that you provide to people? That's a great question. Yeah. I mean, once again, like that, whoever mentioned that, sounds like a, you know, I'm sure a very smart person because like as I said the biggest issues with the TFSA is the withdrawals and deposits right if you're lucky to you know have a be in a good financial situation you don't really have to worry about it because you probably don't touch it you just invest it and it grows but some people have to you know dip in put it back and whatnot so yes definitely important to keep track unfortunately I do not know any such templates uh we don't I can inquire so what I can do is I can send out a message to our team tomorrow um, and see if we have something like that and uh, send it to you and then you can maybe share it with the people <laughs> or something like that. So I, I, I don't know, I don't have any template. Yeah, for, for sure. Yeah, if you, if you have something like that and you send it to me, then I can definitely uh, send it to everyone. That's no problem at all. Um, I do know um, that uh, CRA, they do provide kind of a a tally for every year. If you have a CRA My account, then you can- Don't trust it. CRA. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, but it's good to have your own numbers. And you, yeah, it's true to have your own um, numbers. That's that's uh, that's good too, but- if you kind of Sorry, I'm, okay. sorry to, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to cut you <laughs> this, I'm triggered, that triggered me. Because <laughs> I've had situations where we trusted CRA and like number, it says right there, clear as day. You could put 8,000, 10,000, 7,000. And then we do it, and then as a letter comes in the mail, you over over contributed. Like, what, 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 what do you want us to do? Because they're not up to date always, right? So um, it's a good idea. Yes, it's good to get an idea, but really like try to track it yourself if you can. And yes, that's all. That's all I'm done. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> Um, okay, another one. So when an RSP is rolled over to a non-spouse and gets taxed as income. Is it the taxed? Is it taxed at the marginal rate of the deceased or the recipient? Great question. It's taxed to the estate, so the deceased, essentially, right? So, um, so yeah. If you, if if so, there's been situations which I've seen. I mean, first and foremost, I hope if everybody on this line, please have a will. Like people really don't really underestimate. I remember when I heard Prince died, and Prince didn't have a will. I'm like, how does Prince lived 50 something years as one of the, like the best musicians in the world and wealthy and not having the will. Like it causes so much problems. And I'm sure everybody has a great family and trust everybody, but I am sure it's not going to happen to your family. But I'm just saying, as someone who's been in the profession for 10 plus years, I've seen great families get torn apart because of estates and because people you know, are entitled when it comes to money. I don't know, just people just change when it comes to money. Like, you know, like I've seen families split apart because of money. So um, I say do yourself, a, a, you know, a, a good service here and get a, a will in place that outlines exactly what you want. All the will does is just tells, you know, your speaks for you. It actually speaks for you because you can't speak for yourself anymore, right? You're, 
you know, upstairs with a big man and you can't necessarily speak for yourself and the will allows you to have a voice. And if you don't have that, people have voices for you. And they may not be what you wanted and they may not be, you know, what the right thing is. And then people fight and then anyways. So I just wanted to make that as a point, please get a will, especially if you have children um, and large families. Um, but yeah, it's it, it essentially, it gets taxed to the state. So like I said, I see situations where, you know, the beneficiary, they say your brother uh, is entitled to hundred thousand dollars. They get the full hundred thousand, right? And then your estate will be then the estate, like right, will be then stuck with this tax bill. And now the executor, let's say the other brother or uh, I don't know, a sibling or whatever, is now wondering how we're gonna pay the taxes for the estate. And so that's why it's very important to understand that and you know have that in a will and say, okay, you know, this is a situation, this is what I want. Taxes should be paid first, then paid out to the, you know, whoever. So to answer your question, once again, I know I went off more than I should, but the estate gets taxed and that's the, that's the end of it, yeah. Um, okay, here's one. This one I think will be a quick one. Um, can someone have a TFSA with more than one bank? Great question. Great, great, great question. You can have as many TFSAs as your heart desires. Um, there is no limit to how, how many TFSAs you can have. But as I said earlier, keeping track of your TFSA contributions is paramount. And when people have multiple TFSAs, once again, I, I know I keep saying I've seen everything, but I mean, 10 years, I guess you see a lot, right? So I have a situation literally like last week where I met with a client and someone I've been dealing with before. And I had no idea they had a TFSA somewhere else. Like they, like I remember, cause we're, we're moving over some more money over and I had this conversation with them. Like you were going to your TFSA, this is what is happening. And I guess between the first time we met and now they went to the another institution where they also bank with and that person saw some money in their account and then asked them to open a TFSA and they, maybe they forgot they had one here already. And then they got a huge bill from the government. Luckily, once again, it was a first offense and we wrote a letter to the CRA and said, this is a situation, you know, and they were able to forgive it. But if we didn't do that, she'd be stuck with like $4,000 or something in the bill, right? Which is insane. So you can have as many as you like, because it's all based on your SIN number. So as long as you don't go over the limit, you can have multiple. Just be very, very careful in tracking how much you contribute. Um, okay, great. Um, I have two more questions and I'm going to try and, and squeeze them in here. Um, hopefully we can go through them quickly. I also want to mention um, that um, Michelle just mentioned in the chat that um, that you can use an Excel spreadsheet for tracking a TFSA deposits. Um, so that old, might be, that might be handy. Um, old, Michelle's old school. I love it. Um, as well. Okay. So the next, the final two questions. So to confirm then, do TFSA funds bypass probate in Ontario uh, when they are given to beneficiaries after death? Yeah. So um, yeah, definitely a great question as well. Um, you may got to make sure you put a designated beneficiary, right? So once again, anytime there's a registered account where a beneficiary is designated, they bypass the will, right? Which in, in turn means that they're bypassing probate because all of, all probate is, is the government validating your will, right? And when they validate your will, uh, they charge the estate based on the size of the estate. So if your um, TFSA goes directly to a beneficiary, it is not part of the estate and then they don't, they don't charge uh, probate, so yeah. Okay, and the very last one. Um, so if someone's paying back a large loan um, and the person says they don't need the funds until they have the full amount that can be paid back, do you think the TFSA is a good vehicle um, to, to hold that money as they make those kind of collect the money themselves and make those repayments themselves into a TFSA um, before they pay it to that person? Are there any drawbacks or risks to doing that? Interesting. So, because I like to be clear with things, um, we're talking you owing someone, no, not paying interest to the person. Like, what, what, like, is there more specific? Like, is there 
specifics here. So because it depends. No, no interest. There's no interest. No interest. And so you're just, rather than paying that person in installments, you want to save it in a TFSA and then pay the lump sum to that person. Is that? Yeah, because the person said they just want the money once it's a full payment instead of just small payments. Well, I mean, that's, a, I mean, that's just like a preference thing. Like I said, remember like my whole thing about a TFSA is use it to invest. Like if you can, like, I mean, if you're putting it in there in a savings account, making 0.02%, I don't really see the advantage of that at all. Use that. Like if, if you have like other money that you're looking to invest, that you're like, you want to invest, then allocate the TFSA for that purpose that to invest. But I mean, if this is the only money you have, I guess, and this is just what you're saving to make sure it's enough to pay this person, then it doesn't hurt. Yes, I guess. Um, you can you can invest it in something conservative. I mean, the only drawback is you gotta just be careful, right? Like you know, whenever you invest, you, uh, time horizon is a is a big factor, right? The longer you have, the more aggressive or the more you can invest in something that can pay you more, because you have more time to withstand any short term fluctuations. The last thing you want to do is, you know, save save in a TFSA, save in a TFSA, maybe put in like a stock or something a stock portfolio, whatever. And then right when you, you know, you have enough, the markets crashed 40% and then boom, now you have to wait or start saving again. So you just got to be careful with that in terms of, you can use a TFSA, but where in the TFSA are you allocating the money? Remember the vehicles I talked about, are you just going to put in cash? Sure. Why not? It doesn't hurt. But like I said, if you have, you have other money that you're saving, I would recommend allocating your actual investments in a TFSA. So you use a, um, a tax-free benefit of it. Great. Um, okay, so I, I mean, I don't have any more questions and, I, and we're about that time. We passed a, a few minutes over that hour, um, but I think it was great so that we could get those last questions answered. Um, I just want to say thank you so much, Paul. As I said already, I mean, I think we got a lot of valuable tips, um, a lot of new information, um, and even that that tax free investment account. I think that's a really good description of you know what it should be you know truly used for. Um, and also, I just want to thank everyone for attending tonight's webinar. Um, I really hope that we hope that you enjoyed yourself and that. Um, you know, you learn something. Uh, we will be sending out a survey um, and we would love to hear your feedback just to kind of um, help us on, you know, things that you're looking for, what you liked about it, what you didn't like, so that we can kind of try and cater towards um, what people are looking for. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all again at the next chapter's uh, virtual event. Thank you so much, Paul, and thank you everyone else. Thank you, it's been great.